What is happening guys, Kadi Plays here, bringing you another Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel video. And in today's video, I'm going to be starting a brand new series on the channel uh, around deck building. So this is something that I've been talking about doing for a while now, and I finally, you know, decided to put the work in to actually make it happen. This is going to be a series um, on essentially the basics of deck building in Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, now I say basics, this is a very complicated topic. Uh, it's a very, you know, deep topic, and it's a topic that is very important for the game, you know, whether you're playing it casually or in tournaments, which, you know, as all my other videos are focused on, and this one is going to be as well, I'm going to be looking at deck building in the tournament slash competitive scene. Um, I will say this does translate, you know, pretty aptly to casual play, ladder play on Master Duel. Like, whatever you're going to do, these rules are going to apply across the board, um, but I will be focusing on building, like, an optimal deck. So that's kind of the purpose of this video is, and the rest of the series is going to be teaching people how to build optimal decks and how to build decks accordingly based on the meta that they're in, whatever it might be. So uh, in this video, we're going to be sp specifically focusing on types of decks. And I've laid out five different categories here. We have combo, mid-range, control, stun, and uh, OTK slash going second. Now, this is by no means a truly comprehensive guide of how many types of decks there are in a game like Yu-Gi-Oh. I have already highlighted two on here, so Dragon Link and Cyberstot deck that I have. And Dragon Link, I'm saying this is a combo deck, but it can also play as a mid-range deck. And that's really important to note because a lot of decks on lists like this are hybrid in a sense. And Cyberstot deck, you know, I say this is a mid-range deck, but it's also like a combo slash mid-range hybrid because it has combo tendencies, it has long combo tendencies, it has multi-card plays, as many of these other decks do, but it can also play more mid-range in some situations. Um, and it that is not exclusive to just these two decks, but it's the best way that I can explain that there are broad categories for decks, but then there are also like many, many, many subcategories of decks. So, without further ado, I'm not going to waste anyone else's time on the introduction. Let's go ahead and jump right into the first type of deck I want to talk about, and that is combo decks. So, these are the examples that I have currently in Master Duel. So, um, and again, this is by no means a fully comprehensive list of the decks that are in combo, but these are arguably the four most popular combo decks in the game right now. Uh, Spiral, Dragon Link, Ad Emancipator, and Drytron. So, uh, I also want to make this list universal for any format that we're in, uh, not just the current format that we're in, which is like what we're looking at on screen. Um, so, even if we're in a format a year from now, and none of these decks are even being played, the rules should still apply. So, I just want to put that out there. But, um, some of the pros that are associated with combo decks are they end on multiple disruption inboards. Uh, they're going to end on very large inboards, more often than not. So, Drytron, as many of you probably know, end on either Herald of Perfection, Herald of Ultimateness, maybe a Beatrice, an IP Mascarena, a Mirror Jade, a, De a DPE, Destiny Hero Phoenix Enforcer, Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, like multiple disruptions, as well as potential hand traps. So, they have searchable Herald of Arclight, they also play hand traps like Max C, Ash Blossom, whatever you're going to play. So, this it's kind of like a high risk high reward so sort of strategy right so you're going to end on like really big inboards um, that have basically you know ftk levels of protection um they also have like great ability to play through generic hand traps and what i mean by generic hand traps is n pretty much anything that's not maxi um so pretty much anything that can be played around that's maybe a more in-depth conversation and a more like you know it's a deeper topic but what i mean by that is max c is a card that needs a counter to it or you're not able to be like play around it right so like let's say you're playing sword soul and you start your turn off with ashuna effect special summon itself if they have max c and you don't have Ash Blossom, Called by the Grave, Cross Out Designator, or Gamma in your hand, you can't play around Max C. However, if they have Ash Blossom or Effect Veiler, you can play around it in a sense. Like you can play other engine cards, you can formulate your turns to play around cards like Ash Blossom or Max C. You can chain block. 
So with Sword Soul, another example for that would be Normal Summon Mogi, Mogi Effect, Reveal a Worm in Your Hand or a Sword Soul card, and Special Summon a Token, Synchro into Grandmaster, and then Chain Link, choose the Chain Link order for what you don't want to get Ash Blossomed. So generally speaking, you're going to Chain Link 1, the Grandmaster, Chain Link 2, Mogi. So if they're going to use Ash Blossom, they can only Ash Blossom the Mogi's effect to draw, and you're still going to get your effect to search. That's like playing around Ash Blossom, in a sense. But Max C doesn't have that. And generally speaking, combo decks are very, very good at playing through generic hand traps like Ash Blossom, like Effect Failure. Um, they can be susceptible to Nib Nibiru, which, you know, I'm going to go ahead and uh, add that, actually. Um going to go and add that over here. Oh, I cannot type. But uh, that's something that's really important to note. Another pro of these decks are they have blurry choke points. And that's also kind of an interesting concept to talk about. It's a little bit of a deeper concept um, when it comes to interacting with decks. Um, so it's not really a deck building. I mean, it's more interaction. But combo decks are very hard to interrupt. And this kind of goes hand in hand with being able to play through generic hand traps. Like in Dragon Link, for example, what are you supposed to affect Valor? Are you supposed to affect Valor the Striker Dragon? Are you supposed to affect Valor the Romulus? Or are you supposed to affect Valor the Chaos, uh, the Chaos Ruler? It's hard to know because you don't know the other cards in their hand. You don't know the extension that they have. You don't know what their plan is for the turn because it's more of a freestyle deck than like a linear deck. Um, which is another reason that Dragon Link is kind of outside of the realm of a category because they're such a non-linear deck and they have so many different ways of playing the game that it's even harder to interrupt a deck like that. Now, these checkpoints get... These checkpoints are very dependent, of course, on the matchup. Like, uh, Adam Emancipator might have different checkpoint, like choke points than Dragon Link, might have different choke points in Spiral, and it might vary depending on, you know, the type of interruption you're going to be doing on that choke point, so on and so forth. But, generally speaking, combo decks are very good at blurring the line between what is right and what is wrong to hand trap. And that's a really big pro of them. Uh, of course, there are other pros, but for the purpose of this list, these are kind of the, just the main ones I want to focus on. And then for cons, you guys probably already knew this was going to be here, I already kind of talked about it, Maxi. Maxi is a huge, huge, huge con for combo decks, and I think Maxi is the reason that decks like Ad Emancipator, when they was at full power in, Mac in, in Master Duel, was not like the best deck in the game. This single-handedly warps the meta so much to a point where combo decks are not oppressive, which you can say that's a good thing, you can also say it's a bad thing, it's kind of personal preference. I personally lean towards the side of the max C is a bad thing for the game, but again, that is a different video for a different day. Regardless of that, max C is in the game, and it prevents combo decks from doing combo things. Combo decks normally take a lot of steps to get to where they want to go, and that's usually going to end on a lot of interruptions, a lot of like, recovery, whatever it might be, and max C completely shuts that off. It's very diff different from generic hand traps like Valor, Ash, and Burn, so on and so forth, because, like I said before, it can't be played around. This is not a card that you just are like, oh, with this hand, I'm going to beat Max C. No, you're, you don't really do that. But you can do that with cards like Valor or Ash. Uh, moving on to the next one is very few, very few or no one-card combos. This is really important. Um, this is kind of what separates this deck from... Uh, you know, a mid-range combo hybrid like Cyber Stacks, or maybe even like, you know, Despia, Sword Soul, Tri Brigade, which are some of the mid-range decks we have. Mid-range decks we have on here. These are usually decks. These combo decks are usually ones that require two or more cards to play their turn. Like Dragon Link, for example, it needs a starter and an extender, right? So, whether that is Chaos Space. Chaos Space kind of acts as like a one-card starter or a one-card combo, but it's not really because you need two cards to use it, right? You need a discard fodder and you need it to resolve. So it's kind of like two cards. It's more like a 1.5 card combo. But other than that, usually like the deck needs like let's say a Rocket Tracer in your hand, for example, and 
a uh, abs router or a noctovision something along those lines to start making your plays and get your engine rolling um, that's kind of what makes separates combo from the other mid-range decks is they don't have the ability to play off one card really sometimes they do but very rarely and then uh, I just added it to the list but I think it's very important it's very susceptible to Nibiru this kind of is you know uh, juxtaposed by the idea of blurry choke points because it might be really hard to Nibiru a deck like this so I think you can make the argument that Nibiru uh, is not good against combo decks in certain situations but in other situations it's very good against combo decks because um, all, albeit although the choke points can be blurry there are very distinct choke points that the deck like shows off so with the dragons for example with dragon link for example they're not going to be able to stop Nibiru unless they go into um, Savage. So Borlode Savage Dragon. And you're going to know that they're going into Borlode Savage Dragon because they synchro into it and activate its effect to uh, equip a Link Monster from the Graveyard to get its Omni Negate. So as soon as they activate that effect, you can just hit them with Nibiru. And it's very it's a very easy tell. Decks like Adamantipator are a little bit different because Adamantipator has the ability to synchro into Herald of Arclight at a moment's notice, uh, Baron at a moment's notice, uh, Appalooza, Link off into Appalooza, so on and so forth. So it's a little bit harder to tell in some of those decks, but the more you play against them, the more easy those tell those tells become. And you're like, okay, in this situation, if I was playing this deck, I would go for Appalooza here, so I'm going to go ahead and Nibiru here, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, um, yeah, this... Very similar to Blurry Choke Points, but I think overall, Nibiru is a con for these decks. Anyways, I'm spending way too much time talking about this. Let's move on to mid-range. Uh, some of the options we have here are Sword Sold, Branded Espia, Tribrigade, and Cyberstot deck. Again, I want to highlight Cyberstot deck. This is a very broad category here because um, Agnister is definitely much more quote-unquote combo. But Salamangrate, and, but at the same time, it also has like one card combos, so it doesn't really fall specifically into the combo category because usually combo decks require multiple cards, so on and so forth. And this deck can also play around, these types of decks can also play without comboing. Uh, like Salamangrate, yes, it special summons a lot. Yes, it does require like sometimes multiple card combos, but it can also play off of one card. It can also play off of, you know, very few cards. It can play into Max C. It, it's very hard to uh, assign these types of decks to categories because they're they're all very similar, but they're all very unique from other decks in that sense. I hope I hope that makes sense. But I just put them here. Uh, but you could easily just move the cyber decks up to the combo section, and uh, yeah, the rules are kind of kind of apply. The, these two categories, the line between these two categories can be very blurry sometimes. But anyways, moving on to some of the pros, efficient engine. This is, in my opinion, the best part about mid-range decks. And I think you can make the argument that combo decks have efficient engines too, because usually they do. But that is the biggest, 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 biggest thing about mid-range decks, is their efficient engine and their ability to play a lot of support cards. You know, what I mean by this is Sword Soul, right? Usually in Sword Soul decks, you can play anywhere from 40 to like 45 cards, um, and you can play anywhere from like 10 to 15 hand traps or like 10 to 15 going second cards, support cards, whatever it might be. You can play consistency cards like Pot of Desires. You can play just all the generic cards and you can still efficiently fit your engine into a deck enough to be able to make consistent plays in going first, going second, you know, almost through any board. That's a little bit different than combo decks. Like Drytron, for example, Drytron really struggles to get up get down to that 40 card mark and play 10 plus hand traps it can do it but then it comes usually at the cost of its engine's consistency at emancipator i think at emancipator is closer to this efficient engine category i think this deck a deck like that can play you know 10 plus hand traps and their engine within a 40 card range but it does you know get tight and it also can come at the cost of the engine because the engine requirements are to be able to hit the rocks off the excavations of the Ad Emancipator cards. But, of course, I want to generally make this video for any format, not specifically the one that we're in. And, uh, generally speaking, 
mid-range decks are going to have the mo more efficient engines because they can do what they want to do on less cards and still have room to play a lots of generic support cards, which in turn make them really good going first or second. They um, can usually play 10 to 15 hand traps if they so choose, and you know, or board breakers, like however you want to go about it. And they can also um, break boards very easily with their engines. Their engines are very hard to uh, interact. They're sometimes very hard to interact with. They have very powerful engines. They combo very well off of like one or two cards. And, uh, you know, all in all, like, I mean, the, it's just a nice, well-rounded strategy. Um, hyper consistent. These decks are arguably the most consistent in the game. Uh, I think you might be able to make the argument that, you know, some of the control decks, some of the stun decks, stuff like that are just as consistent, but I, I personally wouldn't make that argument. I think, I think these decks are the most consistent types of decks in the game because again, they can combo off of one card. They can play so many hand traps so they can go second fine. They can, they can do a lot with a little and that's, they're almost, they're almost always going to do the exact same thing. So like, what more could you really want in that situation? Um, and then another pro I have on here is Max C. You might be looking at the screen and being like, okay, this dude's an idiot. And like, why does he have Max C as a D? Well, I'll talk about both of these right now. Uh, for pro, I mean this because a lot of these decks can play through Max C and not give your opponent a lot of draws and still end on a respectable end board. Like Despia, for example. Let's say you take a standard Despia hand. You go, start your turn off, normal summon Alibur. Alibur effect, search Branded Fusion. Activate Branded Fusion, they chain Max C. Okay. Then you go Fusion into your Lebelion. Lebelion effect, discard a card to summon out Mirror Jade. And then you probably sent Tragedy at this point, and you use Tragedy effect to search the ad lib to your hand. Cool. You then give them, that's, so that's two draws. You gave them the Lebelion effect, the Lebelion draw, special summon, and the Mirror Jade draw. So they went from having four cards in their hand after dropping the maxi to having six cards in their hand. Um... Like, okay, so they got a plus one, basically. But you got a mirror jade. It depends on if that trade-off is good. It, it That's hard to equate, and you don't actually know in most situations whether that's pro, like a good or bad play. But what is definitely not a good play, in my opinion, is just going Lebelion pass. Like, that's not going to do anything for you, right? Um, Because at this point, you're already committed, so I might as well give them an extra draw for disruption. And then you can activate mirror jade's effect to... You know, send the Albion from your extra graveyard, banish the Alibur to set a Branded in red. So then your opponent goes, they draw, they have seven cards in their hands. So they basically went plus one, and you ended on two potential interruptions. You ended on Branded in red, which can go into a Guardian Chimera or a Drago, uh, Predator and Drago Stapalia, and you ended on a Mirror Jade Banish when it returns to the field off the Ad Libitum effect. Now, this is obviously assuming that they don't have any interruptions for those plays, but in a vacuum, in a bubble, that's not necessarily a bad trade-off. That's not much farther away from the inboard that Despia is normally going to make, but the difference is your opponent just has an extra card for free. Now, that is a lot better, in my opinion, than a combo deck trying to play through Maxi. So like Drytron, for example, trying to play through Maxi, what is Drytron going to establish by giving your opponent just a plus one with them having max C? Usually you're going to activate, like let's say you activate Alpha in Drytron. Uh, effect, destroy Benton, tribute Benton to summon itself out. Your opponent's going to chain max C. They get one draw off that, and then how are you going to get to an interruption here? You need to summon at least one more time to be able to even go into IP. So minimum, you're going to be giving them three draws because you're going to have to summon again, link off into IP. You know, IP is just an example. I'm not saying you should necessarily go for IP in this situation, but you're going to have to give them a minimum of three draws in a deck like Dreadtron not to establish any disruptions at all. Right? Uh, well, n maybe not no disruptions at all, but potentially no disruptions. So Maxi is clearly in that situation way better against like Drytron than it is Despia. Of course, this is a vacuum, and not all situations are equal, and not all game states are the same. So sometimes um, Drytron will be able to play through Maxi, and sometimes Despia won't. 
But generally speaking, from my experience and from watching tournaments and studying tournament data, Maxi is way less powerful against mid-range decks than it is combo decks. On the flip side, it severely limits you still. It's still one of it. Maxi is still the best card in the game. Maxi is still, in my opinion, an oppressive card. Maxi is still a, just insane. And going, being able to get a free plus one and prevent your opponent from extending just to give them their two interruptions is fine by me. I'll take that every day of the week if I'm going second. Um, so despite mid range decks being able to play through Maxi, it's still very good against them because it. it keeps them in check and yeah i mean really not much to say maxi's kind of just insane so so uh, some of the other pro sorry not the pros some of the cons about mid-range decks are they end on very breakable end boards so the the end board i just talked about so mirror jade plus uh, mirror jade plus branded in red with an ad lib in hand that's a very breakable end board and that's also a very standard end board for this deck in order to go combo past that you really need to open like one or two more like cards that allow you to play. So maybe you opened a way to get another fusion summons, like a fright for car, like uh, a patchwork or polymerization or the branded field spell or branded in red, something like that. Those cards are going to allow you to extend into more diverse, powerful inboards. But generally speaking, their inboards are just like one or two interruptions and some good follow up. So very breakable. Uh, same thing with Sword Soul. Sword Soul is usually going to end on like a Grandmaster Baron, Blackout, you know, Grandmaster Baron, and either like a Blackout or a Protos or something like that. Very breakable inboards. Like a lot, not a lot of interruptions here. And questionable follow up, depending on how they decided to play their turn. Um, obvious choke points. This is the opposite of combo decks. Uh, these decks are have very, very, very glaring telltale signs like of what they're going to do. So if you normal summon Alibur, that's just Valor or Imperm bait, right? So just Valor or Imperm. The only way you would really question that is if they have a Despia or Albaz in the graveyard that they're going to punish you with a Branded in Red. Now, you know, that's important to note, but if they have Branded in Red, then they're beating your Valor or Imperm no matter what. So you could say, well, I'll just hold it for my turn, but that only works in the case of Imperm. And it's just all around a kind of a difficult situation to be in if you're playing against a Despia player that opened the Branded in Red plus the Alibur and has access to dump a Despia or Albus to the graveyard. They're just probably going to beat your hand trap, but there's not much you can do in that situation. However, that does not change the fact that they give you obvious choke points. A Branded Fusion is a very obvious choke point. Ash hit. The Alibur is a very obvious Valor or Imperm or Gamma, whatever you're going to do. Uh, for Sword Soul, it also has very obvious, like, signs. They might have the way to play around it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So if they normal summon Mo Yi, that's Valor or Imperm bait. Not bait, but that's, you're supposed to Valor or Imperm there, right? If they have the, um, Circle, I think is what it's called. Yeah, I don't know the full name, but, uh, the Heavenly Circle or whatever it's called. The one that, like, basically lets you tribute a worm. Quick play lets you tribute a worm to search. If they have that, they just beat your hand trap. But it's the same thing with Despia. Um, so, obvious choke points that can be beaten, but I'm rambling. Anyways, moving on. to They are very susceptible to generic hand traps, like I just said. This is very goes hand-in-hand hand with the obvious choke points. They lose very hard to well-timed hand traps if you don't have the multi-combo out, the multi-card out. So... Like we just said, Branded in Red plus Despia plus Alibur, fine. Mohi plus Circle or whatever, fine. But if they don't have that, it's very susceptible to hand traps. Now we've already talked about Maxi. So moving on to Control. So I want to note that I've got Control and Stun here as two separate categories, but these can often be kind of blurred and put in the same category. But I'm going to have, keep them distinct for the purpose of this video because I think they have different goals. Okay? So Control, the examples I have are like Sky Striker and Altergeist. I'm sure there might be some better examples, but these are the first two that came to mind when I was putting this list together. So we're going to go with these. What are these good against? Well, Max C is not very good against them at all. These decks don't really special summon very much at all. They'll maybe summon like once or twice in a turn, but if you Max C them, they're just going to stop because they don't care. Like why, like why does Sky Striker care about Max C? 
just, okay, I'll just beat you next turn instead of this turn. Or I'll just gain advantage, significant advantage next turn instead of this turn. Like, it's cool. You're not going to kill me. And that dubs over to saying they have a great, great grind game. It's very difficult to put these decks away. If you don't put them, and if you don't put them away, you're going to lose in the long run because they almost never run out of gas. Um, but yeah, um, these are decks that kind of just like do exactly what the title says, and like they control the state of the game. They prevent your opponent from overextending. They recycle their cards. They kind of just like slow and steady wins the race. It's kind of the motto of these decks. But they don't play. They don't necessarily play like floodgates or something like that. That's going to stun your opponent. They just kind of control the pace of the game. Uh, and the main con here is they require a lot of setup. They're very slow, and I should add that on there. They're slow, often. They're oftentimes they're slow. Um, but to be honest, there's not much to talk about with these decks. I think it kind of goes without saying that um, if you're able to beat these decks early, like you have to beat these decks early because you're not going to beat them light, like late. And uh, Moving on to the stun category, I got Eldritch and Fluendaries here. I think these are definitely the most two notable stun decks. Uh, you could also talk about like Umi Control right now, but I don't know if that's a real deck or not. I haven't looked at it enough to actually be able to tell. Uh, but the main pros of these are, well, Floodgates, obviously. Like, Floodgates are insane cards. And Floodgates are also not exclusive to stun decks. Like, a lot of these decks up here can play Floodgates. Dragon Link can play Floodgates. It can play the Quakimiro uh, Drago guy. Sword Soul can play Protos. Despia, and they can play like Rivalry. Dragons can play Rivalry. Like a lot of this stuff can play like Floodgate type cards, but they're not necessarily core to the strategies like the inherent stun decks are. So Eldritch, albeit not an inherent stun archetype, benefits greatly from floodgate cards in their deck and it's very no it's very commonly played like you play skill drains summon limits rivalries gozens you name it and it just doesn't it doesn't those cards don't hurt the deck itself but they hurt everything else pretty much so obviously there's that flunderies they've got built-in floodgates in the form of uh, the impin the what's it called the barrier statue they can play cards like dimension shifter which is absolutely insane and that's one noted on here power card slash floodgates and i noted shifter because shifter is just an incredibly powerful card they uh can play hyper consistency cards so they these decks play at 40 cards very easily and they can play like a lot of draw power usually so they can play the pot of extravagances maybe even pot of dualities like so on and so forth just to see the cards they want very very often uh, honestly the biggest pro is probably the fact that they don't maxi doesn't do anything against these decks Eldritch, sometimes Maxi will get you like two draws, one or two draws, which is cool. But nine times out of ten, it's really bad against Eldritch. And 100 times out of 100, it's really bad against Flunderies. So, I mean, Maxi's the best card in the game. Like, these decks are good because Maxi's not good against them. Uh, but moving on to some of the cons. Some of the biggest cons are that blowout cards like Duster, Evenly, Red Reboot are very very good against these decks. They're almost like game ending sometimes against these decks. Um, Flunderies, you might be like, okay, well, Red Reboot's not that good against the deck, but it is. Uh, not like most of the time, Flunderies is going to end on Impin, Statue, and uh, the Trap, so Dreaming Town. One Red Reboot is just very, like, lead you to be able to break that board so, so easily because. They activate the Dreaming Town, you red reboot it. Okay, cool. Then you proceed to, you know, summon something, kill the barrier statue, whatever you're gonna do. And then then you're able to play under Impin because Impin's very easy to play around. It's hard to play around when you have to play through a Dreaming Town and a statue. But just the Impin is pretty easy to play around most times. So red reboot might not be the best card against that deck, but it does go a long way in helping break that board. Uh, that's a long-winded way of saying there is a lot of cards in the game that completely just destroy these stun decks. Like one well-timed evenly, one well-timed duster, one well-timed reboot is just going to end this deck's career. So, And then another thing, these decks are really, it's really hard to play these decks going second. It's hard to play these decks going into boards. Usually you're very reliant on opening uh, power cards. So 
it, you're going to need to draw a shifter. You're going to need to draw a maxi. You're going to need to draw a dark ruler no more. Something along the lines, in the case of Flunderies, right? Eldritch is probably not going to play that. But you need to draw into those cards to be able to beat the board your opponent establishes or is attempting to establish. Um, but so yeah, moving on to the final category here, we have OTK slash going second. These decks, I just put them on here because sadly they're notable. <laughs> They've been topping tournaments, and I think it's important to like understand that this is a type of deck that you can play and you can run into. Um, it's like Numeron and Eight Axis. They these decks don't care about the coin flip, and that's I think one of the biggest pros about them. You know exactly what you're going to do or attempt to do every single game, regardless of who wins the coin flip. If your opponent wins the coin flip great let them go first if you win the coin flip let them go first it's not a big deal so that's really cool about these decks and they also have the ability to play a lot of power cards similar to stun decks they have the ability to play cards like dimension shifter lava golem dark ruler no more just really powerful border breaker cards that are just designed to index careers basically some of the cons they are very susceptible susceptible to generic hand traps and i should also like um Note about stun decks, it, it's very dependent on the deck of what it loses to. Like, Florinda Reese, for example, is very susceptible to generic hand traps. But Eldritch, on the other hand, is not. But, yeah, anyways, not going to go back to that category. Um, going second slash decay decks are very susceptible to generic hand traps. Like, the Numeron strategy, it goes for the... Um, the num Yeah, so the Numeron strategy goes for, like, the, you know, OTK, like summons the four exceeds that all double each other's attacks, blah, 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 blah. You know, one well-timed Valor, like, kind of just puts that deck in a situation where it's not able to kill you. And you're like, okay, well, what are you going to do next? Because I'm going to beat you in the grind game more than likely. Um, but there's that for the 8 axes deck. If you um, hit, I think it's a rank 8 that summons the other guy from the extra deck that goes like 9,000 attack with a Numeron Dragon or whatever it's called. Like one well-timed Valor kind of just shuts that play down, right? And they also um, rely on like multi-card combos usually. So like one good Ash is just going to end it. Or not like multi-card combos necessarily, but one really powerful card resolving. And sometimes Ash or Valor or Imperm just hits that card. So it's really good. And of course, I think the biggest flaw with these decks is the fact that it's a one-trick pony kind of deck. Like this deck does literally the same thing every single game. And you can make that argument that all these other decks do the same thing every single game, but there's a very distinct and clear way that this deck wins, and it can't win any other way than that, basically. And once you fall for it once, you're not going to fall for it again. So on a best of three situation, look, let's say best of three, game one, you win the coin toss, you go first, you get OTK'd by Numeron. Okay, game two, let them go first. What are they going to do? Game three, yeah, you've got to go first again for game three because they're going to make you go first, but then you know how to play around the cards that they're playing. And it's really hard to fall for the same tricks twice. Same thing with like the 8-axis deck. Um, so These decks are interesting, but I think that... Sorry about that. But I think all in all, they just... They're too one-tricked oriented to like consistently be winning, but despite that, it's important to note that these decks do exist. And when looking at deck building, um, this is the first step into the, into getting into the deck building like cycle. What I want you guys to do is I want you to take us like take some time and decide what deck you want to play. This is the first step in deck building, and it's saying like, okay, looking at these different categories. What type of deck do I want to play? Which one of these pros and which ones of these like which of these cons speak to me? You know, you want to find a good balance of both of them. And say, like, hey, I want to play power cards like Floodgates. Okay, well then start looking at some of like these decks down here, right? If you say like I want a hyper consistent strategy, like okay, start looking at, you know, maybe a mid-range deck. If you start if you say I want a deck that just absolutely just plays through a bunch of hand drafts going first you know definitely go with a combo deck right so the first process of deck building is deciding what type of deck that you want to play based on the pros and cons of the different kinds of strategies so 
that is going to do it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if this video does good, I'm definitely going to continue that. Well, I'm probably going to continue this series no matter what. Uh, but I would love to see in the comment section below, like what improvements you guys have for me to make on a series like this. Like, is it okay that I'm doing this recording on, you know, an Excel sheet and like laying out like a graph like this, not a graph, but like um, a chart like this. Like, is this okay? Or do you want to see something like on Dueling Book or a Master Duel Meadow where I kind of talk about this stuff? Just let me know down in the comment section below um, how I should continue these videos from here. And uh, yeah, let me know what, uh, what type of decks you guys are wanting to play. So again, thank you guys so much for watching. Like I already said before, leave a like, comment, subscribe, and uh, have a great rest of your day. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.